Finance Committee will come to order. Before we begin this morning, I want to congratulate the committee's own Susanna Siegel on reaching 12 years of Senate service, one of the big milestones that we celebrate here in the Congress. Her career in the Senate began in the office of Senator James Exxon of Nebraska, and after some years away, she decided to come back to the Senate and join the Finance Committee staff. Without the efforts of Susanna and our entire group of clerks, the committee really would grind to a halt. So on behalf of myself and Senator Crapo, the bipartisan alignment of the United States uh, Senate Committee on Finance is just here to give a congratulations <coughs> to Susanna, thank her on behalf of the entire committee, and Senator Crapo and I have a tradition of trying to make sure that people get uh, adequate recognition. So where is, oh, there's Susanna. Okay, great. Stand on behalf right of both of us, thank you. All right. Great. I'm supposed to clap in the committee room, but we're <clears throat> glad you already did it for Susanna. So on the subject of today's hearing, the Finance Committee has broad jurisdiction over international trade, a keen interest in fighting for strong environmental protections, and a commitment to level the playing field for our ranchers, our farmers, and our workers. Today's hearing is focused on a multinational meat producer turning a blind eye as parts of its supply chain, burn down the Amazon, push the world to climate catastrophe, and undercut our American ranchers who play by the international trade rules. This issue has been the focus of a two-year investigation by the committee. I'd wager that most Americans understand that deforestation in the Amazon is a recipe for environmental disaster. When you burn the Amazon, you burn the lungs of the earth. Huge portions of the Amazon have been clear cut and burned to create ranch land. The Brazilian government, foreign governments, including ours and international groups working on anti-corruption and environmental protection have tried to stop it. Yet the rate of deforestation is at a recent high and cattle produced as a direct result of deforestation are still making their way into global supply chains. Among those major beef producers sourcing that cattle is JBS, the largest meat supplier, the largest supplier in the world by sales. Going back years, JBS has made promises <clears throat> it would clean up its act when it came to deforestation. Most recently, it said it would eliminate cattle involved in deforestation from supply chains by 2025. The reality is JBS is nowhere near meeting this commitment. Not even JBS's direct suppliers are totally clean. But the bigger scheme is the cattle ranching shell game that goes on throughout JBS's supply chain. It's what's known as cattle laundering. Here's how it works. <clears throat> While the JBS looks the other way, Ranchers take cattle born and raised on illegally deforested land and ships them to ranches with a clean record. Suddenly, those cattle are no longer considered the product of illegal deforestation. On buying and processing that cattle, JBS can claim that they're upholding the commitments to protect the Amazon. That beef, folks, might even wind up on a 4th of July picnic table somewhere here in the United States. This process also allows JBS to do some greenwashing when it comes to their reputation. And they can hide their role in the burning of the Amazon this way. American ranchers are forced to compete in a rigged game against a corporate giant. Get that, our ranchers. We're gonna hear from Senator Tester, for example, who's all about farmers and ranchers all the time. And these farmers have to compete against a corporate giant. It gets away with flouting the rules. Independent investigations of just a sliver of JBS's supply chain have found that JBS purchased thousands of head of cattle that had been laundered in this manner between 2018 and 2020 alone. For its part, JBS has taken steps to hide the truth. They hired an auditor to monitor compliance with the 2009 environmental agreement. 
When the auditor clarified that its assessment focused only on JBS's direct purchases, not its overall supply chain, JBS then went out and misrepresented the results of its work. What they did is they found a different auditor. The Finance Committee wrote to JBS and the auditor asking for key records and information, but this multinational was stonewalling. Upon further questioning, JBS said it was impossible to monitor its indirect suppliers. However, outside investigators that lacked JBS's considerable resources were able to analyze the records that proved the existence, existence of deforestation in the company's supply chain. One of the most important tools for tracking the origin of cattle is a type of cattle shipment record maintained by the Brazilian government called a Guide of Animal Transport, most commonly known as the GTA. They're essential for independent investigation of Brazil's ranching industry. Recently, the Brazilian government has restricted public access to these GTAs. That's got to change. The U.S. government, and particularly the U.S. Trade Representative, has to work to open the records up. Finally, I'm just going to close with a quick uh, comment about some of the legislation that I think we ought to be looking at. The bottom line here is American ranchers aren't getting a fair shake. And I am very honored, Senator Tester here, Senator Tester here, one of the lead sponsors of a very important bipartisan bill, the Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act. Senator Tester and Senator Fisher, and I think Senator Grassley is here, yes. We've been working on this now for a significant length of time to get a fair shake because the big guys, the big providers are pushing around the small guys. And what we've tried to do on this bipartisan basis, Senator Grassley here, Senator Fisher, Senator Tester and myself, is to come up with a piece of legislation that's bipartisan. See the young people here. We're getting the Democrats and Republicans together to help the ranchers. And we ought to level the playing field, and it would bring some much-needed transparency and accountability to the cattle market. Beyond that, I'm very interested in working with my colleague, uh, Senator Crapo, the ranking uh, member, and he and I have worked together on so many things over the years. I think, frankly, we've got to modernize and improve the customs system. And I think uh, that goes along with pushing for better data collection and information sharing that can shed some real sunlight on the U.S. supply chain. So we've got a lot to talk about today. Um, thank our witnesses. We're going to introduce you real quick, and uh, let's hear from Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Over the years, you and I have done a lot of good work on forests in our own backyards, particularly with respect to improvements to forest management and wildfire budgeting. I appreciate the time and effort that you and your staff have put in to assess the root causes of deforestation in the Amazon. The Amazon rainforest, with, with most of it sitting literally in Brazil's backyard, is the largest remaining tropical forest and one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. Scientists and governments say that its overall importance to the world cannot even be measured by just its more than 3 million plant and animal species or over 20 million people who call it home, including 50 remote tribes which have not even made first contact with modern civilization. In fact, the world is still learning about all of the benefits that the Amazon rainforest may bring to the planet and its people, both natural and as a means to elevate the economy and standard of living of its residents. In response to an alarming rate of deforestation, Brazil was prompted to construct a legal framework between the 1980s and into the early 2000s to protect half of the Amazon lands, either as indigenous territories or conservation units. Through the evolution of its laws, Brazil's goal is to balance its environmental, security, and economic demands for the Amazon. But the issue is not the number or quality of its laws so much as it is the lack of enforcement, resources, and personnel required to effectively protect the vast lands of the Amazon. Countless studies spanning a decade chronicle illegal land-grabbing activities of various enterprises as the main accelerators of deforestation. More specifically, these studies point to the economic success of such enterprises as empowering various illicit actors to burrow into and hide within the complex supply chains and function with near impunity across regions where accountability is limited by the vagaries of national and local political will against the sheer size of the Amazon. 
which is itself governed in Brazil by a unique and highly independent constituent state system. Conservation and progress do not need to be at odds. Measures can respect the rights of legitimate property owners and balance the needs for conservation and community, even one as large as the Amazon. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today, which will prove particularly useful to the chairman as he continues his investigation into the ways that may abate Brazil's deforestation of the Amazon. One thing we must all keep in mind before any actions are taken for the purpose of helping Brazil manage its problems in the Amazon is the potential for unintended consequences that may arise, a concern which was highlighted in a June 15th letter sent to the chairman and me from Minister Councillor Beloso at the Brazilian Embassy. Teddy Roosevelt, who provided the impetus early in our country's history for establishing both the U.S. Forest and the National Park Services had it exactly right. This nation, the nation, behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets which it must turn over to the next generation increased and not impaired in value. Conservation means development as much as it does protection. If the chairman uh, uh, doesn't mind, let's proceed with this hearing and we will, we will, uh, oh, excuse me. I don't think you introduced it, so there, there is this letter that I just referenced. Could we introduce that letter? Absolutely, uh, Sword. Without objection. Well, you never go wrong around here when you quote Teddy Roosevelt on, uh, on public lands, and I just want to thank uh, Senator Crapo. We've all been working together on this. I think that's a very constructive kind of statement, and we're going to continue this inquiry and work very closely, just as you say, uh, to go step by step and be careful about unintended consequences. So really thank my colleague for all the ongoing cooperation. Let me just introduce our uh, witnesses. I'm going to save um, uh, opportunity for Senator Tester to introduce a witness that was important to him, Mr. Jason Weller, Global Chief Sustainability Officer at JBS. He previously held sustainability posts at other companies and led the Natural Resources Conservation Service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Welcome. Mr. Rick Jacobson is the Manager of Commodities Policy and Environmental Investigation Agency. There he leads the work to tackle commodity-driven deforestation in Brazil. Before that job, he had uh, a position at another NGO, Global Witness, for 10 years. Our next witness will be Dr. Ryan Berg. He's director of the Americas Program at the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies, where his work includes trade and development issues. Dr. Berg was a Fulbright Scholar in Brazil and also lived and worked in the uh, country. And we're going to turn it over to Senator Tester to introduce the final witness. And this is a fellow who knows something about land because he's always getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to figure out how to get uh, uh, off the farm and back to D.C. Senator Tester, glad you're here. I, I'm glad to be here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wyden. Thank you, Ranking Member Crapo. And I also want to say thank you to both for your opening statements. Um, spot on. Uh, Senator Grassley, somebody who's been working on antitrust activities my entire life, thank you. It's great to appear before you. Senators Johnson, Cardin, Bennett. It's a first-class outfit, and I hope we can do something on this issue because it's an important hearing. Most of you know that I'm involved in agriculture, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm a farmer. The guy to my right is a rancher. He works hard, and he produces top-quality beef that consumers can trust. Our American ranchers set the gold standard for taking care of their land and bringing safe market products to market. Uh, today I'm honored to introduce an American rancher who's going to share his story that embodies the best of the cattle industry. The guy to my right is a guy by the name of Leo McDonald. Him and his wife, Sam, run McDonald Angus, which has herds uh, in Montana and in North Dakota. He knows how to raise fine beef. He knows how important the grass resource is. He received degrees from Texas Tech University and the University of Wyoming in animal nutrition and animal science. And Leo's work goes far beyond his ranch. He truly is a leader in the beef industry, including serving as chair of the Montana Cattle Feeders and director of U.S. Cattlemen's. Uh, Leo, it is an incredible honor 
to introduce you today. Most importantly, you're in front of the Senate Finance Committee. This committee, I have said, and I serve on appropriations, but this is the most powerful committee in the United States Senate. These folks can make things happen. Good luck in your testimony. It's on you. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Leo. What an intro. Thank you, Senator Tester. Fly safe. Mr. Wheeler, welcome. Why don't you start? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Crapo, distinguished members of the committee. I'm Jason Weller, and I serve, as Mr. Chairman, you indicated, the Global Sustainability Officer for JBS. And as you indicated, I very proudly have dedicated my career, both in public service and in private industry, helping farmers and ranchers improve the sustainability of their operations. So I serve proudly at USDA, at the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and also most recently with the Land O'Lakes Farmer Cooperative System, helping to establish Truterra, the sustainability business, through that farmer co-op system. Um, so now I work at JBS. And JBS is a global, diversified food company, creating high-quality beef, pork, poultry, fish, and plant-based products for customers and consumers around the world, employing over 250,000 team members globally and present in more than 20 countries. In our view, the key to combating deforestation, both illegal and legal, is eliminating incentives for forest clearing by landowners and providing producers with financial and technical assistance to support sustainable intensification, integrated farming systems, and restorative land practices. JBS has a four-pronged approach to combating potential deforestation in our supply chains. That includes, first, a zero-tolerance sourcing policy, second, supply chain monitoring and enforcement, third, technical assistance for producers, and fourth, multi-stakeholder engagement to accelerate sectoral change. JBS has a clear deforestation commitment in the Amazon, which includes, as Mr. Chairman indicated, a zero deforestation by direct suppliers by the end of this year, and a zero deforestation commitment by indirect suppliers by the end of 2025. To support these commitments, JBS established the Responsible Procurement Policy that prohibits the purchase of livestock from farms involved in deforestation, forced labor, invasion of indigenous territories, or embargoed by Brazilian environmental authorities. JBS has also developed a cattle supplier monitoring system that leverages public data, satellite imagery, and georeference data to verify compliance with socio-environmental standards. In addition, the Transparent Livestock Farming Platform is a digital platform built and developed by JBS to increase the visibility to the tens of thousands of farms that sell cattle to our direct suppliers. This free, confidential, open source, and online platform uses blockchain technology to extend monitoring of our direct suppliers to their suppliers. Producers with whom the company does not have a direct business relationship, but who are a critical part of the supply chain. Simply blocking farms with deforestation concerns is not enough because these block farms will continue to produce cattle and other ag commodities. They'll find a way to enter regional and global food supply chains. As a result, JBS has established a network of 18 green offices to provide free technical support and extension services to farmers. The JBS green offices include teams of specialists and consultants who provide free technical support to producers to help them bring their farms into compliance. We also provide free agronomic and business planning services to, to the farmers through our a farm program to help enhance the productivity, profitability, and sustainability of their operations. Finally, we actively participate in global forums, including the UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, the World Economic Forum, and the Tropical Forest Alliance-supported roadmap to 1.5 degrees centigrade to find solutions to the causes of deforestation. The deforestation challenge in Brazil and the ag commodity supply chains around the world is larger than any one company or even one sector can solve on its own. We must have a strategic, system-wide approach that addresses the root causes of deforestation, improves its transparency, and provides incentives and support for farmers to steward their lands and maintain their livelihoods. In closing, I will also briefly comment on the testimony of some of my fellow panelists, particularly whose comments call for EU-style regulation, because advocates for such regulation won't stop in the pastures of Brazil. Some of the policy prescriptions we agree with, particularly in the need for increased transparency and traceability in the cattle supply chain, JBS certainly understands this challenge and has been working collaboratively for many years right. with the cattle industry, federal and state governments, and non-governmental organizations to increase transparency. Other policy proposals, however, strike me as punitive and zero-sum, restrictive and regulatory. At their core, they're antithetical to the strong heritage in the United States, 
of engagement and collaboration, whether in trade or particularly in supporting farmers and ranchers. The policy recommendations do not address the underlying causes of deforestation or the socioeconomic challenges in the Amazon region and will not change materially the results, whether slowing deforestation or retarding the growth of the Brazilian cattle sector. Instead of short-term tactical thrusts, we need strategic leadership in win-win engagement. In the end, the intertwined goal of food production and climate mitigation is our greatest challenge as a global food system. We need both the American and Brazilian rancher to be successful. We are literally all in this together. In JBS, policymakers, regulators, civil society, farmers, and consumers have a willing partner who is investing in and committed to combating deforestation. And we take our role and responsibility in the global food system very seriously. I thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, that. Mr. Jacobson. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the Finance Committee, thank you for inviting me to appear before the committee today for this hearing on cattle supply chains and deforestation of the Amazon. I've investigated natural resource-related crime and its links to global supply chains for the past 15 years, most recently with the Environmental Investigation Agency, a Washington-based nonprofit dedicated to exposing environmental crimes around the world and developing policy solutions. The investigations I've been involved in have shown time and again how opaque and unaccountable global supply chains allow goods linked to some of the worst crimes and abuses to enter international markets, whether this be armed conflict, corruption, forced labor, or the focus of my current work at EIA, illegal deforestation driven by the production of agricultural commodities. These supply chain risks are particularly prominent in Brazil's cattle sector, the largest driver of deforestation in the Amazon. The Amazon rainforest is of global importance for the biodiversity it harbors and the billions of tons of carbon dioxide it absorbs and stores. It is also the front line of the struggle of indigenous peoples to protect forests they have occupied and stewarded for centuries from illegal invasions by loggers, miners, ranchers, and wildlife traffickers, often at great personal risk of violence against indigenous leaders and community members. Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon, most of it illegal, reached a 15-year high under the Bolsonaro government. The links between deforestation and cattle supply chains in Brazil have been well documented by government auditors, civil society groups, and investigative journalists in recent years. It is too much to summarize in the time I have today. This is despite the three largest meat companies in Brazil committing to remove deforestation from their supply chains more than a decade ago. The number of cattle in the Amazon, in the meantime, has increased by 30% uh, since 2004, while the size of the herd in the rest of Brazil remained relatively stable. Our own recent the published investigation used cattle transport permits and other data to track thousands of cattle raised on farms involved in illegal deforestation in the Amazon into the supply chains of Brazilian meat and leather companies, including the world's largest JBS. We found that serious weaknesses in voluntary corporate monitoring systems and government oversight allowed these cattle to be laundered into company supply chains via intermediaries. Proposed improvements to corporate traceability systems are years away and unlikely to address the problems uncovered by our investigation. In the absence of full birth to slaughter traceability and measures to crack down on fraud and abuse of government permitting and land registration systems, companies will not be able to ensure that cattle from high-risk regions like the Amazon are free of deforestation and crime. These problems have not prevented Brazil from becoming the world's largest exporter of cattle products. The U.S. is the second largest destination of, for beef products from Brazil, valued at over $1 billion last year. The U.S. is also among the largest importers of Brazilian leather. I hope we can all agree that the U.S. should not be a destination for illegally produced goods that are driving the destruction of the Amazon rainforest and undermining the livelihoods of law-abiding ranchers in the U.S. and Brazil alike. I want to spend the, my remaining time talking about a piece of legislation designed to ensure this isn't the case. The Forest Act, introduced in the last Congress by Senator Schatz and Representatives Blumenauer and Fitzpatrick and co-sponsors, and expected to be reintroduced soon, would represent a critical step forward in fighting corruption and environmental crime abroad while reducing our footprint on the world's forests. The bill is supported by nearly 50 environmental human rights, faith-based, and anti-corruption NGOs. The Forest Act would, among other things, amend the U.S. Tariff Act to prohibit imports of products containing certain agricultural commodities, including cattle, produced on illegally deforested land, and require companies to carry out and report on risk-based supply chain due diligence and traceability. 
including birth to slaughter traceability in the case of, of cattle imports. The bill comes at a time when there is growing momentum and industry support for regulatory approaches to decouple agricultural production from deforestation. The European Union recently, as has been mentioned, recently passed regulation requiring agricultural commodities placed on its market to be traceable, legal, and deforestation free. The UK has also passed legislation along these lines. The US must take similar action or risk becoming a dumping ground for products Europe is closing its doors to. The Lula government recently announced a plan to halt deforestation by 2030 with improved law enforcement, monitoring, and traceability among its key provisions. The US should provide Brazil with the direct financial and technical support it needs to be successful and swiftly pass the Forest Act, which would reinforce these efforts by providing a powerful market incentive from the world's largest economy for traceable, legal, and deforestation-free products. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Berg, you'll be next. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and distinguished members of the Senate Committee on Finance, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify on this very important topic. After alarming numbers of deforestation during President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva's first term from 2002 to 2006, the Brazilian President managed to turn these numbers around and contribute to a decline in deforestation in his second term. Missing from this story, however, is the concurrent deceleration of Brazil's economy. In Lula's first term, a strong nexus between deforestation rates and Brazil's economic growth was established. After Lula's second term ended, Brazil entered a period of economic stagnation and domestic political instability, and a focus on deforestation faded, with more proximate concerns, such as low and negative economic growth, as well as a wide-ranging corruption scandal that roiled much of the political and economic elite dominating Brazil's domestic debates. Quite simply, Brazil has never fully managed to sunder deforestation from the drivers of its economic growth. Upon taking office in 2019, Bolsonaro prioritized reform and economic growth, especially for the 30 to 35 million Brazilians who call the Amazon home and live in areas that generally lag in terms of their socioeconomic development. According to Brazil's National Institute for Space Research, deforestation rose during these years, and cattle ranching is a driver of this de deforestation in Brazil's Amazon. The rainforest, especially during the burning season, is often slashed and burned to make spaces for illegal pastures. But having said this, I do want to broaden the aperture today as well. Simply put, I love Brazil. It's my favorite country in the Western Hemisphere. I've lived there. I've worked there. I've studied there on a, on a Fulbright scholarship, as the chairman mentioned. I've traveled extensively there. And I care deeply about the United States having a productive bilateral relationship with Brazil uh, in order to advance this important conversation, which is a very important component of it. So in order to broaden the aperture a little bit, I think we must consider the following things as drivers of deforestation in conjunction with cattle ranching. First, transnational criminal organizations. The Amazon is rife with lawlessness, Rampant criminal activities such as illicit wildlife trade, illegal logging, and illegal gold mining have all had a pernicious role in fomenting deforestation in Brazil. And the increase in the price of gold recently has contributed to a mining boom in the, boom in the Amazon, leaving a pockmarked landscape of open air pits. Second, China and the insatiable demand for soy. The role of Brazil's soy industry is also underappreciated in contributing to Brazil's changing landscape and its increasing carbon footprint. In addition to having 60% of the Amazon, Brazil houses South America's largest savanna, which is called the Cejado, representing about 21% of the country's landmass. The Cejado is the second largest geographic area in Brazil behind the Amazon, and it's an important carbon sink as well. Driven largely by China's insatiable demand for soy, the Cejado has lost an immense amount of its green cover and carbon absorption potential, and I think this should concern us very much. It's estimated that only about 20% of the Cejado's original vegetation remains intact. And a lot of this has to do with Brazil's monoculture farming, which carries significant implications, and the way China, as a buyer of its products, has reoriented Brazil's domestic economy away from industrial growth and towards commodities-based growth. Third, the domestic headwinds that I mentioned. The biggest challenge in Brazil is structural and economic and thus unlikely to change drastically under Lula's tenure. Manufacturing once accounted for 36% of Brazil's GDP. It now represents just 13% of Brazil's GDP. 
yet Brazil remains largely an, an underdeveloped country. And economists term this phenomenon premature deindustrialization, whereby industry moves to cheaper locales and yet large segments of the society have failed to receive the benefits of any industrialization process. Brazil is suffering from one of the worst cases of premature deindustrialization in the world. So without a robust manufacturing base and without bringing Brazil into some of our nearshoring efforts to shore up that manufacturing base, there are a few alternative areas for the Lula government to generate substantial growth outside of agribusiness. So quickly in the time that I have remaining, I'd like to move to a couple policy recommendations. First, a multifaceted challenge requires multifaceted approaches. Cattle ranching, of course, is an important driver of deforestation. Supply chains should be monitored and made transparent. We have to broaden the aperture and understand how this deindustrialization process has a nexus. Sino-Brazilian relations have a nexus. The criminal regime in Venezuela is doing its part to destroy the Amazon and the explosion of transnational organized crime. Second, I would say we should prioritize a cooperative approach over a highly punitive one. Divestment in Brazil, sanctions and tariffs is something that we often hear about, uh, but I think that this approach will contribute to de deterioration in our bilateral relations with Brazil. And the last thing I'll mention, uh, Senators, is that I think we need to understand how these dynamics work in Brazilian domestic politics. Too often policymakers fail to appreciate how the Amazon is seen within Brazil itself, uh, which is to say it's largely seen as a sovereignty issue. And the more that we push on Brazil on this issue, there is a uh, risk that we will uh, cause Brazilian diplomats and Brazilians themselves to bristle. Um, and, and so there, there are studies that I can refer to later uh, which basically show that international climate criticism has increased uh, a domestic political market in Brazil for politicians who resist and defy this criticism, especially when the individuals we're, are questioned. We're, we're just going to have to move it. on, Dr. Berg. If you'll put the rest of it in, your, in the record, that'd be Thank great. you very much. I'll okay, Mr. Question. Mr. McDonald. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member, member Crapo, uh, members of the Senate Finance Committee, and uh, Senator Grassley, who uh, uh, may not remember me, but we did a lot of work uh, during the cattle trade cases uh, with Senator Daschle and was there in 2012 uh, when he stood up for the Farm Bill in the conference room, and it's great to be here. On behalf of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association and our fellow cattle producers, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, we're often defined as a small industry, just one or one and a half, two percent of the population, but really in my mind anybody that eats is in agriculture and the consumers are a great part of our industry. In the last 50 years, Brazil has lost 20 percent of the Amazon rainforest to illegal deforestation. In the same period, the Brazilian cow herd grew from 79.6 million in the 70s to 241.6 million head today. Brazil is now the number one exporter of beef, a position that the U.S. and Australia once held. And uh, last year, I think, was the number three beef importer into the U.S. And this year, as of April 1st, the number two beef importer into the U.S. So they've really grown. Meanwhile, the U.S. cattle herd is shrunk from 130 million head in 1970 to around 90 million the first of this year. But even with that shrink, we've increased our beef production 20, from 22.2 billion pounds uh, in the 70s up to 28.4, which is quite a story. During this same time, our environmental footprint has dropped 34 percent in greenhouse gas emissions per carcass weight produced, and total carcass greenhouse emissions related to beef production has also decreased 21 percent here in the U.S. As a comparison, just between, just between 2005 and 2019, Brazilian greenhouse gas emissions grew by 19 percent, just for that shorter period. You know, this tells a great story for U.S. cattle producers, uh, producing more with less and improving our environment. Uh, that's why we have so many generational farmers and ranchers coming back into the business. We've been doing a good job with sustainability and, and our environment for a long time. Uh, and I'll tell you what, we didn't do it by degrading our environment through illegal deforestation and poor farming and grazing practices, nor did we use it by using, using forced labor, both slave and child labor. 
or by bribing meat inspectors to improperly launder and dump beef into the international market and even our own markets that it had fraudulent laboratory checks or by exporting product that was rampant food safety concerns, including the finding of blood clots, bone chips, abscesses, and I can go on, that's been a chronic problem with Brazil, or by failing to notify our world communities in a timely matter when we had FMD outbreaks, foot and mouth disease, or BSC, granted the last one they did report, or by bribing uh, 1,800 government officials to secure loans from Brazilian government banks and pension plans or as the Department of Justice reported, violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act through a scheme, a scheme, a JBS scheme, to bribe government officials in Brazil to secure financing and other industry growth benefits, or paying a $27 million fine to settle charges brought by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission regarding bribery schemes used to eventually purchase U.S. companies, to outbid U.S. companies. No, the U.S. cattle industry didn't go under those corruptive practices. And then, after acquiring one of these U.S. firms, just recently found guilty of price fixing, bid rigging, supply manipulation to inflate prices of U.S. chicken, pork, and beef. No, the U.S. cattle builders didn't build our industry that way. We built it through generations of dedication and service to our families, communities, industry, and country. That's how we built it. But in more recent history, we've seen international companies come in and dominate our U.S. meat industry, marginalize our ranchers. Uh, billions and billions of dollars, folks, have been taken out of these ranches since 2015. The very families that built this country fought and died for it. Those very families. And we've watched companies like JBS and Marf steal from them, marginalize them. You know, agriculture has the highest, second highest, no, the, the highest suicide rate of any industry, occupation, according to the Center of Disease Control. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to. Well, we'll have some questions in a minute, and I'm going to try and see if I can cover two or three things, see if we can do it fairly quickly. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, you've spent a lot of time on the ground in, in Brazil doing the dangerous work of observing uh, these cattle industry you know, abuses. And um, obviously, this is all about trade cheating and how this cattle laundering loophole you know, works. And, about direct suppliers and somehow everybody's being disguised. Just tell us briefly, how does beef from deforested land enter the supply chain? Uh, thank you for the question. So our investigation in Brazil started when we obtained a list of illegal ranchers inside a protected area, one of the most heavily deforested protected areas in the Amazon. And uh, we were also able to compile a database of cattle transport permits, uh, millions of them, uh, that allowed us to follow uh, animals from farm to farm. Uh, and what this allowed us to do is uh, track cattle from the protected area to the slaughterhouses in the region. Uh, the slaughterhouses in this particular region are largely run by JBS, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, Marfrig and Minerva, uh, the other two largest meat companies in Brazil. And what was surprising, or maybe not surprising, is that uh, none of the cows being moved off of the protected area went to these slaughterhouses, virtually none. Uh, I should say we did find a few instances where they went directly to JBS slaughterhouses. Uh, but most of them uh, moved to another farm outside of the protected area before they were sold to a slaughterhouse. And in fact, the majority of them moved to at least two farms before they reached the slaughterhouse. So uh, in, in, in many cases, this appeared to be a deliberate effort by ranchers to uh, use uh, weaknesses in the oversight of, of the permitting process in order to create a paper trail that hid where the cattle were coming from. Thank you. Very helpful. Uh, Mr. McDonald, just a question for you. You heard you know, Mr. Jacobson and others talking about JBS essentially being a multinational trade sheet. And you know, we're hearing that... Uh, this beef competes with ranchers 
in Montana, my home state of Oregon, and in Wyoming, what's it like on the ground for a rancher to compete with these behemoths, these multinational, you know, giants? What's it like for you? Well, as you know, we have worse supply test in this industry. In fact, that would be hard to be heard of. Uh, I don't know how far you want me to go, Senator. How do you even compete when you can't identify your product in this market? Because the country will origin labeling away from us one of the greatest markets we've ever had, and we're letting Brazil come in here. You talk about uh, greenwashing. We have greenwashing in our food supply today to U.S. consumers because they're allowed to carry a USDA inspection stamp, which a lot of consumers think is U.S. product. Uh, they, JBS fought us like heck and got us to feel cool, right? And now we know why. They get to launder their product through here to an unsuspecting consumer who's who thinks it's a U.S. product, and, and uh, it makes us feel pretty hollow, sir, okay. to have to com compete with them in that way, because we're not competing with them. <clears throat> They're well, taking our market from us. Well, we'll have some other questions for you in a moment. I'm just so glad that you're here. Uh, I want to wrap up my uh, questioning here, Mr. Jacobson, with respect <clears throat> to you know, the fact that JBS and these beef companies have been promising to clean up their act for you know, something like 15 years. And now Brazil requires ranchers to create records for each cow called a GTA. And recently the government has restricted, actually restricted public access to these. Are you of the view that increasing access to these GTAs would be a good first step to creating a traceable and transparent supply chain? <clears throat> Uh, the GTAs were central to the investigation we carried out, and I uh, just wanted to emphasize that we're a very small NGO with limited resources, uh, but using modern computing technology, uh, one data analyst was able to review millions of GTAs and really put together supply chains across an entire Amazon state. So I think you know, the, the, the potential of these permits is, is remarkable, and as you said, uh, the transparency is, is actually being rolled back. And this is despite public prosecutors in Brazil having made the case that Brazilian Good. law protects the transparency. I'm gonna just ask one more question for you, Mr. Weller, and I, I'd really like a yes or no answer to this question. I'd like to know if JBS will use its considerable influence to support making public records that already exist and that will show whether or not JBS lives up to its promises? That's a yes or no question. Yes. Okay. Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Senator Wyden. And actually, uh, I'm going to go back to your question about GTAs. Uh, it's it's uh, the first question I had in my mind as, as well. <clears throat> the, uh, and I'd like to ask Dr. Berg, and Frank, you had any, any of the other witnesses to jump in on this question. Is full implementation of uh, these cattle transport per permits, such as GTAs, uh, a solution? And I also understand that there are um, items called CARs, which are rural property registrations, that may also be a tool that is helpful. Could Dr. Berg, could you go first? But anybody could jump in on these, this question. Thank you, uh, Ra Ranking Member Crapo, for this very important question. So, um, you know, I think. GTAs certainly give us uh, some level of transparency in, into the supply chain. Uh, what I would say is the way that things are organized in Brazil, it is a federative, federative pub republic, which means that states and state governors and state legislatures do have considerable power over policymaking in the country. And what we've seen in Brazil, uh, even though Lula da Silva won, re uh, won his election, uh, Bolsonaro had coattails, which is to say he has uh, allies, uh, folks uh, who, who are um, more pro-ag industry in certain governorships and state legislatures. And there are a diversity of a variegated set of policies across the states in Brazil on the GTAs. Some are delivered uh, digitally, some are literally still written in paper form. So it's really a, a, a sort of hodgepodge or patchwork of, of policies that doesn't have any sort of common thread uh, through it, and that's a difficult element of, of this all, using the GTAs to bring greater transparency to the supply chain. 
so I'm hearing you say that it's in their federal system in Brazil, it's, it's really hard to implement, but also that it would be a good idea if we could. Is that a fair summary of what you say? Senator Crapo, I think it's, a, it's an important element of getting greater transparency into the supply chain. Uh, I think that, uh, as folks on the, this panel will testify, there are probably still ways to get around the, the GTA, but I, I think it is an important part of bringing transparency on where cattle are moving and what role they might be playing in, in deforestation. But I, I wouldn't characterize it as a silver bullet. All right, thank you. Mr. Weller, do you want to weigh in on this? Yes, please, sir. Uh, I'd just like to add to that. But before I do, I'd also just like for context for the senators and for the committee's consideration in terms of just, uh, in terms of Brazilian exports. So first, just setting the, 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 the context for total beef production in Brazil and consumption. Almost three quarters of all beef produced in Brazil is consumed domestically. Okay, so about 25%, 26% is actually exported. Of that, only 2% it's exported to the United States. But I just want to set the, the context. It's actually less than 2% is actually exported to the United States. So it's, we're not exporting, competing against American ranchers domestically. And even arguably, you know, internationally, again, the, and I highly tout and credit the American rancher. I strongly agree with Mr. McDonald. And they should be lauded, and, and we are very proud of to be working with American ranchers to help them produce their beef and export that beef. But frankly, it's such a high quality product, it competes in different markets. To your question on GTA, sir, um, yes, in, in, in also following up on Chairman Wyden's questions on G GTAs, to be clear, Brazilian law has very strong privacy protections. So while other NGOs have had access to, and we're still unable to under determine where they get access to these GTAs, we as a company legally cannot get GTAs access, these animal transit permits, past our direct suppliers. So this gets into the whole challenge of the dark market, the indirect market, where we don't understand where the cattle are inbound from. So we strongly agree, if this was opened up, if we had more robust public access to the GTAs, certainly would it help us as a cattle buyer, but also more broadly across public and private and civil society understand where these cattle are moving around. In addition, the cars, the rural permits, these are where it, it essentially creates the place where the cattle are born, right? It's understanding the land, who owns the land, and the farm itself. So when you couple the animal transit permits with the cars, the rural um, farming permits, that's where you can start to put together the beginnings of a supply chain transparency. Ultimately though, these are solutions we're trying to ultimately get towards what we really need is animal ID, true traceability. And this is something that is not really outside of one state in Brazil, is not really available. So we're trying to find you know, uh, solutions that are not really fit for purpose. The, the GTA is really a phytosanitary animals, you know, welfare and food safety measure that we're then trying to use essentially to back and work upstream to really understand where the cattle are coming from. And it's an enormously complex challenge. Well, thank you very much. I just want to respond to this point about this debate of percentages because I'm going to take a look at all this. But, you know, my assessment is that this percentage that is exported still involves a lot of beef, A, and B, has a lot of effect on Mr. McDonald and people in my state who are ranchers. Do you disagree? We were just citing... Yes or, yes or no? Uh, yes, you I do, do disagree. You do disagree? Yes, sir. How so? It's a significant amount of beef. It affects our consumers. It affects our ranchers. That's what Mr. McDonald sitting over here says. You know what? I'll do this because I'm over my time. I'd like a written answer to the question of whether this affects American ranchers and American consumers, because I think it's pretty clear it does. Senator Grassley, you're next. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for in your opening remarks, you mentioned the legislation that Tester, you and I and Fisher have in, along with 12 Republicans and 10 Democrats, called the uh, uh, Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act, which is meant to give individual cattle feeders that want to negotiate a daily price, and if they get a market, sometimes can't deliver their cattle for 30 days, uh, to, uh, to undo the monopolistic uh, practice that the three biggest packers in the United States has with the uh, big feedlots of Texas and Kansas and Colorado and I suppose Oklahoma, where they eat up 85 percent 
of the uh, chain capacity uh, every day so that uh, the independent producers that want to negotiate a price instead of contracting have a hard time delivering their cattle, and it's meant to take care of that unfair practice. Uh, beyond that, before I get to my first question, uh, I think uh, because electric vehicles need rare earth minerals like nickel found in rainforests of the Philippines and Indonesia, and Ford's electric uh, F-150 has aluminum tied to mining in the Amazon. I want to make very clear that it's just not agriculture that is responsible for a lot of the, uh, 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 the elimination of rainforest and the threat that that has to the environment and the unfair competition that a lot of these bad environmental policies uh, bring to American agriculture. Uh, I'm going to start out with Mr. Berg. <clears throat> For decades, we have had issues with the European Union on how they view the use of biotechnology in trade. While Chairman Wyden has good intentions with holding this hearing and having this investigation, I'm concerned that our country is looking to increase uh, tr trade barriers as a result of some of these issues. As um, your uh, testimony points out, uh, President uh, Lula has uh, positioned himself as a defender of the Amazon and has a plan to stop illegal deforestation of the Amazon by 2030, cutting down the road of implementing trade barriers or going down that road of trade barriers at this point could be counterproductive. I'm concerned that any trade barriers added will just mean additional tariffs for U.S. products into Brazil. Uh, and as an example, just this year, Brazil instituted a 16% tariff rate on U.S. Uh, ethanol. Uh, they did this while having duty-free access to U.S. markets. So to you, what are the ways that we can work with Brazil to curb deforestation so that we can have a cooperative trade relationship without escalating into a tit-for-tat tariff war? Thank you very much, Senator, for, for that question. Uh, I do think that the cooperative approach is, is the most productive for the bilateral relationship that we have with Brazil. Uh, I think we often tend to talk about divestment, imposing tariffs or sanctions uh, to try to go after Brazil's deforestation. It's something we've seen the European Union use as well. Uh, the, the size of its market to, to limit goods. Uh, however, I do worry about some of the good work that's being done in all of the binational institutions that we have with Brazil. And the one that I would cite in this case would be the, the U.S.-Brazil CEO Forum, where you've got a lot of companies that are talking about uh, cleaning up practices, bringing more transparency uh, to supply chains and so on. That's a very cooperative approach, an example of one that I can give you, where the two countries are having a, a conversation that's, that's attempting to move the needle and where that would actually be at risk if we took too punitive of an approach. In general, I would say the risk with Brazil is that reciprocity is a very important part of their diplomacy. If we do something, they tend to do something back. Uh, it exists in the political domain as it does in, in the economic domain. And you mentioned uh, uh, things with, with ethanol. That doesn't surprise me at all. Brazil sees reciprocity as, as a, a very serious matter. And so I suspect if we take trade-related measures to curb deforestation on Brazil, we should very much expect there to be some kind of reciprocal action on the part of the Brazilians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my colleague, and uh, I just want to tell him, because I, I noted your uh, comments, that we will work in a bipartisan way, as you and I have tried to do so often, particularly uh, our Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act that both of us mentioned. That came about because we put in a lot of sweat equity to try to find common ground between the parties. And I also want to reference another point uh, my colleague you know, made uh, about other industries, because I think that's a valid point uh, as well. So the committee has been conducting an investigation into auto manufacturing supply chains, so that uh, I would just say to my colleague that uh, your point about not taking a blind eye to other industries is a uh, very smart one, and we're going to pursue it. Look forward to working with him. Thank you. Okay, Senator Johnson, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By the way, this is a fascinating hearing. 
a completely nonpartisan hearing. Uh, and I think that's what's always puzzled me about the, the problem here with the deforestation of the rainforest. I think globally, everybody wants to stop the deforestation, correct? Except for the individuals that benefit it economically. Um, you know, Professor Berg, I think your testimony I thought was pretty fascinating because you talked about manufacturing going from, what was it, 25% down to 13%? So it was from 36 36 to 13. to 13, so it's, so it's a third yeah. of what it was. Correct. Uh, you know, Mr. Weller, you, you strike me as a very sincere individual working for a company that, that wants to solve this problem too, that's very difficult to solve. So that's the crux, you know, how, how do you solve a problem? That, that, again, I've, I'd always define a problem as something that doesn't have an easy solution. This is a problem. Um, I think it has to be cooperatively. I mean, is it, entering into trade agreements where we open up for manufacturing. Uh, bullying doesn't seem to be working. So I'm just, so I really want to talk to you know, Mr. Weller and to Professor Berg, you know, back to what Senator Grassley talked about. What, what is the solution here? What's, what, what's not working, what won't work, and what do we really need to do here? So if I, if I may lean in on my experience here in the United States and having spent time in Brazil, Brazilian farmers and ranchers are no different than American farmers and ranchers. Um, they want to make a living. They want to steward their lands. They want to pass on their operations to kin and family. They don't want to pollute the environment. They want to ultimately see their business succeed. By, by the way, real quick, interject. I've always heard that the land that's reclaimed is not particularly productive. It is not. And that's a key point. Absolutely, what you put your finger on is that, in our view, it's a two-part component. You have to have strong standards. Do not disagree. We must have very strong standards and enforce those. But by, then, by the way, another injection, you know, coming from the medical device industry where traceability was everything, you had to trace it back to the resin pellet. I mean, that's something your company, I guess we kind of look to companies like yours to enforce that traceability, whether you can get access to government records or not. I mean, you're, you're the buyer. You can exert an awful lot of pressure. So we can, and we can, we can get those records from our direct, buy, direct suppliers, but the issue is the hundreds of thousands of ranchers above them that supply cattle to that supply chain. And that's what we're investing in building that capacity to get that traceability. But the second part here is then the incentives. So here in the United States, you know, through the Farm Bill, my experience working with farmers and ranchers, we have a, a strong heritage, a century of investment through the extension services, through universities, and through USDA services to co-invest with the farm and rancher. There's a huge opportunity the same in Brazil where for forest stewardship, you first need to compensate where, where landowners can legally clear forest. They need to be compensated for that economic value. And where there's illegal deforestation, absolutely block that. But then blocking isn't enough. So we referenced uh, poor productivity. So in general, in the Amazon region, their stocking rates are about one head per hectare. That's about two and a half acres. Enormously not very poor production. Through basic agronomy, this is what we're working on, and we really need help and additional investment. So this would be an opportunity of co-investment with the Brazilian government. In basic agronomy, nutrient management, livestock management, you can double, triple, quadruple that intensification of that pasture without having to then push deeper into the forest. So you're making them more profitable, producing more food on less land, and doing so in a way of reducing both emissions, sequestering more carbon. So, Dr. Berg, I would think you would agree with that. And, you know, Mr. McDonald, I think you would agree with that as well, wouldn't you? I mean, let's start with Dr. Berg. Thanks, thanks, Senator. I think your question gets to the heart of one of the points I was trying to make in my testimony, which is if you don't want people to have incentives to go out and deforest, which I don't think any of us want, uh, want them to have, we need to find ways to help Brazil uh, create more economic opportunities, create incentives for individuals to not go out and, uh, and deforest. That 36 to 13 percent number is pretty dramatic for me, right? A lot of it has to do with the Brazil-China relationship, hollowing out Brazil's uh, domestic manufacturing base. Take, for example, two big cities in the Amazon, Belém and Manaus. These are two cities of both about two and a half million people metro area. They're actually pretty close to the United States because they sit in, in the northern parts of Brazil. We should think about including them somehow in special economic zones and some of our efforts to nearshore supply chains uh, because without that alternative uh, livelihood, you're going to continue with some of the incentives to deforest. And that, that's what I worry about when I try to shed some light on it in my testimony. Mr. McDonald, I'd just like to hear your comment on that. Yeah. Who has? On the defense, but I would like to point out, you know, Norway has donated a lot of money, a lot of money, into the Amazon and Brazil, and uh, 
for deforestation, and it hasn't went very well, and I think the U.S. has even kicked more money in. It doesn't mean we stop, but I think we need more accountability as we work with them when we haven't had that. And I'm still very concerned about JBS. Uh, I'm not here to pick on anybody or degrade them, but you look at their track record, and they act just like the mafia did here in the meat business 50, 60 years ago. It's terrible. And now we're going to trust these people who have bribed government officials down in their own country to track this? And I'm sorry, but, you know, the facts show that they're not good people. And so far, they need to earn our trust before we give them ours. Mr. Chairman, again, I, you know, I'm concerned about loss of the Amazon because of the loss of the biodiversity, which will never be reclaimed. I know others have other concerns, but to me, this is something that really we should be working in a completely nonpartisan basis. And, yeah, I think around the world we want to preserve the Amazon. So I really appreciate this hearing. Really want to work with you. We're, we're going to work very hard to get a bipartisan coalition for reform here in the committee. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse, you're next. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for your work and uh, Ranking Member Crapos getting this hearing together. Um, Mr. Jacobson, Jacobson, your testimony supports the uh, Forest Act, correct? That's right. Um, do all of the witnesses support that legislation? Which one? Senator, I have to say I haven't uh, read it in full, so I can't give you a, a full answer. I think what's clear from this hearing is I have to also have to go read end to end the Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act as well. Would you mind taking that as a question for the record, each of you, and get back to me with your views if you can't disclose them here today on the Forest Act and whether you or your organization supports it or not? No, ours does. U.S. Cattlemen's supports. All right, great. So we've got yes from Mr. McDonald, yes from Mr. Jacobson. We'll get back to me from uh, Mr. Berg and Mr. Weller. Uh, Senator Cassidy and I um, have a bill on customs modernization, very cleverly called the Customs Modernization Act. Um, what do you think that Customs and Border Patrol needs to attack this supply chain transparency problem? Start with you, Mr. Jacobson. Well, as I explained in my testimony, uh, you know, critical to uh, keeping things like illegal deforestation out of global supply chains is traceability. Yep. And, uh, and we've how does CBP need to improve itself so that it can have a better handle on that? Yeah, so one of the things CBP needs is information. Yep. And, and that's why a key part of the Forest Act is, is import declaration requirements, because CBP has limited reach overseas about that part of the supply chain. So that's something that needs to be reported to CBP so they can better monitor. Yep. And we've seen how the, the lack of information has really stymied efforts to uh, enforce uh, other existing legislation around forced labor and, and also illegal timber. Yeah, you, you point out, I think, quite correctly that supply chain traceability and transparency is important in dealing with the deforestation of the Amazon, but it's also very important in a whole variety of other areas as well. Care to name any others? Well, well, as I mentioned, forced labor is key. Uh, we've also seen, I've seen in my investigations how even uh, minerals from armed conflict, uh, you know, in Africa find their way into our uh, cell phones and electronic devices. So uh, I, I think this is a pretty universal need uh, and, and part of, of modernizing trade is that we actually know where the things that we're allowing into our market came from. And there are uh, existing areas where American corporations not only require disclosures from their direct supply chain sellers, but they require those sellers to report on their own supply chains, and in fact even further, as uh, Senator Johnson said, all the way back to the original uh, raw manufacturing materials in some cases. That is not anything that's unusual or new to ask of an American company, is it? 
I think it's pretty straightforward with the technologies that exist. Uh, if, if you want to know where your supplier got their materials, you require them to provide it to you as a, as a uh, you know, matter of terms of business. Nothing too complicated about that. You just have to require the information to be presented to you, correct? Yeah, I agree. And Mr. McDonald, is that what your company does? Trace sourcing up the supply chain so that you know where yeah. things come from? Yeah. We're in the feedstock business, so we don't process any beef, but we raise a lot of cattle. We're one of the largest sellers of breeding bulls in the U.S. Uh, we've actually used these EIDs for 15, 20 years. I just love them, especially the 840 that USDA has us used, uh, it's a permanent one. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very much into that, especially if, if it's uh, voluntary and not mandated, but... Uh, yeah, very useful tool. There's a lot of good technology for that. Good. All right. Well, my time has expired. Thank you very much. We'll continue working on the Customs Modernization Act um, to try to make sure that uh, CBP has the resources and the tools and the information so that we don't have to be having these hearings. We actually solve the problem uh, right at the very get-go. Thanks, I, Chairman. I, I think my colleague's point about modernizing what goes on at Customs is certainly one of our priorities, and I look forward to working with him on that. Uh, we're waiting for a couple of, of colleagues uh, who were told uh, by both sides are on their way. So I would just uh, say to the staffs and my colleagues who are following this that uh, we're, it's, it's a hectic day and we're getting almost to the end of it. I think uh, I'm not going to filibuster while our, our colleagues are, <laughs> are on their way. But I was just curious to your reaction, Mr. McDonnell. I think we heard... Mr. Weller, you know, say that, you know, this percentage of beef that's being sent to the United States is, in his view, really small, and it's not something that has, you know, a lot to do with ranchers and consumers, you know, here. And uh, I'm curious what you think of that statement. Because it looks to well, me, looks to me, yeah. you can have the debate about the percentage, and we're going to go through all the records, but still looks to me like a lot of beef. Well, it's the same records, too. And you know, we, I think uh, we imported around 460 million pounds of beef from Brazil in 2022. If you convert that to live cattle, it's around 64, 65,000. We slaughtered around 28, 30 million cattle. So, yeah, it's 2%. Uh, but I, I think what you got to remember is that we have a very supply-sensitive industry, right? And we're also very marginalized in agriculture. And I know you folks, a lot of you don't get it that don't live in rural America, but you know, a lot of times we're only getting two, three, four percent on our investments. That's what we make. Some years we don't make anything. Wouldn't that be tough, huh? But we know farmers and ranchers, we're resilient. So two percent that could impact our price up to four percent is very huge when you're only getting a three to four percent return on your money most years, right? But it's worse than that, because at times it comes in and surges, and that's been identified by Commerce and ITC. I mean, don't forget what, what the ITC said here several years ago in our industry about cattle and beef. Packers can and do use imports to suppress domestic prices. That was found. And we've, the Republican commissioners on the Senate Review Commission said the same thing. So it doesn't take much to manipulate it. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention you were talking about urban and, and rural. I do live in Portland, Oregon, a city. wish I could have played for the Portland Trailblazers. But I will tell you I'm going to be up Friday morning around 3 to get a plane it's not a nonstop or anything, to Ontario, you know, Oregon. So I can be there talking to farmers and ranchers and the like. So you, you got a lot of us who uh, are working very hard to kind of bring together <clears throat> the urban areas and the rural areas and try to find more common ground. I think uh, that's yes, sir. Uh, how I'd put it. All right. Uh, let's see. Republicans, no more? Democrats? Okay. Um, we want to thank all of you for your testimony. You've made it clear that huge portions of the Amazon are being cleared out and burned to create ranch land while JBS looks the other way. And that isn't fair.
to American ranchers like Mr. McDonald, like the people I'm going to see here in the next 24 hours, it's not fair to them. And ultimately, we're going to pay a price for this kind of trade cheating. And certainly, you burn the Amazon, you burn the lungs of the earth. And I'm of the view that multinational companies and governments have to do more to create sustainable and transparent supply chains. And as we so often do here in the Finance Committee, I'm going to close by saying that we're going to continue to try to find common ground. Senator Crapo and I have been able to do that, working with our colleagues on a lot of uh, issues where everybody said it was just impossible. So we're going to focus on, uh, on that in the days ahead. Members will have 14 days to submit any questions or statements for the record. And the Finance Committee is now adjourned. <laughs>